Now let's move on to disorders of galactose metabolism. In galactose metabolism, galactose is converted into glucose so that it can be used in glycolysis from the beginning of the pathway here. This mostly takes place in the liver, but other tissues also have the metabolism of glucose to a lesser extent. Normally, dietary lactose is broken down into galactose and glucose. Next, the galactose is then phosphorylated by galactokinase to galactose 1-phosphate. This galactose 1-phosphate is converted by uridyl transferase to a glucose 1-phosphate, which uh, then is fed into the glycolysis pathway starting at the beginning, um, depending on whether it's needed for the glycolysis pathway or for gluconeogenesis. Now what happens if you're missing some of the galactose metabolic enzymes? Galactokinase deficiency is an autosomal recessive deficiency of galactokinase. This prevents the phosphorylation of galactose and instead causes it to be shunted into an alcohol form, galactitol. Now, this is catalyzed by the enzyme aldolase reductase. Now, we'll see this enzyme convert glucose to sorbitol in the next slide. A galactokinase deficiency is usually a mild condition, but galactitol does accumulate within cells, and it can cause galactosemia, infantile cataracts, a failure to track objects, or uh, a failure to develop a social smile. Now, we have another disorder called classic galactosemia, and it's a more serious autosomal deficiency of galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. A deficiency of uridyl transferase causes the galactose 1-phosphate and galactitol to accumulate inside cells. So it causes some of the same effects as a galactokinase deficiency, such as infantile cataracts, um, as well as new symptoms such as galactose 1-phosphate accumulation, like jaundice, hepatomegaly, or E. coli sepsis in neonates. Now, these are similar to what you would see in fructose uh, intolerance, since in both cases, you're accumulating a phosphorylated form of the monosaccharide. Now, these phosphorylated forms of the monosaccharide accumulate within hepatocytes, causing liver damage, and then you also decrease phosphate stores uh, within the body as well here. Now, the treatment for classic galactosemia is simple you don't eat anything with galactose or even lactose in it. Now, as promised, we're going to see our aldolase reductase come back again in our discussion about sorbitol. Sorbitol, which is shown here, is basically a reduced form of glucose, which is formed by the enzyme aldolase reductase. Now, this enzyme should sound familiar since it also converts galactose to galactitol. Sorbitol is formed to trap glucose inside cells, and this trapped glucose can then be converted later to fructose via sorbitol dehydrogenase. So our goal here is to trap glucose within the cell via our aldolase reductase. However, if a tissue lacks sorbitol dehydrogenase, so if we lack that enzyme, which breaks down our sorbitol, Toxic levels of sorbitol can accumulate, so sorbitol is going to accumulate inside cells, which causes damage because it's going to be osmotically active. What do I mean when I say it's osmotically active? It's going to create a gradient that pulls water into the cell, causing it to swell. In states of persistent hyperglycemia, such as diabetes, you're going to have high sorbitol levels, and this can cause damage to the lens, the retina, the kidneys, Schwann cells, since all of these only have aldolase reductase and no sorbitol dehydrogenase. Now, this can cause uh, cataracts, retinopathy, glomerular disease. Now, does this sound familiar? It should sound kind of like diabetes. Now, you may also see peripheral neuropathy as well, and then all of these are common symptoms of diabetes. Similar to sorbitol, galactosemia can also result in the conversion to osmotically active alcohol form galactitol via aldolase reductase. 
Let's do a quick flash quiz. A man with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes has poor vision and tingling in his feet. How may sorbitol be at fault? Well, this is because hyperglycemia can lead to sorbitol levels to accumulate and cause osmotic damage within the cell. Now this is mostly prominent in cells that lack sorbitol dehydrogenase to break down this sorbitol, including Schwann cells, the lens, the retina, and the kidney. Have you ever heard somebody say that they're lactose intolerant or they have a lactase deficiency? Now lactase is going to be a brush border enzyme on the small bowel or the small intestine lumen. So now it's going to hydrolyze, which is this fancy word for split, the disaccharide lactose into its constituents, glucose and galactose. Now these can then be brought into the enterocyte and absorbed. Now a deficiency of lactose can either be hereditary, which is going to be commonly found in the Asian and Native American population, uh, age-dependent, or transient following a bout of gastroenteritis. Now how does a lactase deficiency typically present? Symptoms of lactase deficiency and subsequent lactose intolerance include bloating, cramps, osmotic diarrhea. You'll see these symptoms because lactose will not be absorbed into the cell and will therefore pull the water out of the GI tract due to this osmotic gradient that it's going to create. Now bacteria in the gut can then use this lactose to form methane leading to the flaxuins. That's why you see that flaxuins is because the bacteria will use the lactose if your body doesn't. Now you can diagnose a lactase deficiency clinically, but stool testing will demonstrate a decreased pH and breath tests will uh, show an increased hydrogen content. So stool studies will show a decreased pH, while breath tests may show an increased hydrogen content. Now the treatment uh, is, is a crime if you ask me, but it's to avoid lactose in the diet. Or you can take some pills that contain uh, the lactase enzyme along with food, so that way you have lactase in your system and you can have some lactose. So what am I talking about? I'm talking milk. If you see on the boards, they say a patient is intolerant to milk. They get the cramps, they get the bloats, uh, they could have a lactase deficiency. You may also see it in whey, uh, which is another high lactose containing food. All right, so here's some symptoms that you may see. We've kind of already talked about that, but it's all due to the lactase enzyme here. Um, the lactase breaks down the disaccharide lactose into its constituents, which can get absorbed. Now let's talk about the amino acids. So far we've covered the topics including the metabolism of nucleic acids and carbohydrates, but now we'll move into proteins and their building blocks which are the amino acids. Now I like to think of uh, my amino acids as kind of like Lego building blocks to build our protein castle. Alright, so only the L form of amino acids, the lovely form is how I think of it, the L form of amino acids are going to be found in proteins. That's because they're lovely. Now these amino acids can be categorized whether essential or non-essential and whether they're acidic, basic, and neutral. So we're going to classify these amino acids based on their properties. We're going to start off with essential amino acids. Now essential amino acids simply means that they need to be supplied by the diet. Now since humans can't produce them, yeah, we're not that good of a species. We're a good species, but we're not that good. Since we're not that good, we can't produce uh, certain amino acids. Now we're going to talk about the glucogenic essential amino acids, which simply means they can be converted to glucose, yeah, we talked about glucose, via the gluconeogenesis in the liver. And this includes methionine, valine, and histidine. Now there are many more non-essential glucogenic amino acids, and the reason they are glucogenic is because they can be used to make either a pyruvate or one of the TCA cycle intermediates. Now, do you remember what the purely ketogenic amino acids are? The purely ketogenic amino acids include leucine and lysine. 
Now these can be converted to ketone bodies. Ketone bodies. So these include the leucine and lysine. Remember that. Do you remember what enzyme deficiency would you need to have to give purely ketogenic amino acids as a treatment? Hopefully you're remembering pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Now, pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency requires giving the ketogenic amino acids to bypass this deficient or defective enzyme here. Now, the essential amino acids that can be converted to either glucose or ketone bodies include the isoleucine, phenylalanine, threonine, and tryptophan. So, notice how we can convert our amino acids into glucose derivatives that kind of fit within our glycolysis, uh, TCA cycle, or we can have ketogenic essential amino acids, which are the leucine and lysines, or we can have a combination of both. Now, the acidic amino acids, remember I said it can be acidic, basic, or neutral. Well, let's talk about the acidic amino acids here. These are going to have a negative charge at physiologic pH, and these will include aspartic acid and glutamic acid, also known as aspartate and glutamate. Now, the basic amino acids, which are going to be positively charged at physiologic pH, include arginine, lysine, and histidine. Now, arginine is going to be the most basic, and histidine uh, does not actually have a positive charge at physiologic pH. Um, however, it is categorized as basic uh, amino acid.